we're looking at is the end of the world coming. So we've been looking at archaeological findings, things that have been unearthed that confirm the Bible, and I'd like to branch into something else that really shows that the Word of God, the Bible, truly is the Word of God. If we go to Isaiah 46, this is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Do you get that? I mean, we can look at the weather forecast, for example. What's, gonna, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? But how often is that wrong, you know? <laughs> But God says he knew from ancient times the things that are not yet done. And when Jesus came to this earth, this is what he said. Now I tell you, before it come, that when it has come to pass, you may believe that I am he. See the same principle there. Jesus knew the future. He had divine revelation. And of course, there's that classic prophecy, which Jesus gave in Matthew 24. Ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Have you heard that prophecy before? It's a fairly well-known one. Now, I've got a little video clip, which I put together. It's a few years old now, but it just illustrates how much is going on in the world that we just we don't hear about that is really fulfilling that prophecy. So I'm going to see if I can play that now. And it just... It pulls together some news items and just shows how much the world is really fulfilling that prophecy. And I believe we haven't seen anything yet. Things are really, really coming. No man knows the day or the hour, as the scripture says, but we do know the season we're living in. It is obvious that Christ is coming soon for his church. Something is, you know, radically different. We have many terms linking heat and violence, and that connection has some worried as the global climate changes. A major new study finds a clear link between rising temperatures and aggression, from domestic violence to murder and even war. We're in the midst of an epidemic of violence, Jesus said, and because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just as it was in the days of Noah. But what were the days of Noah like? We don't have to guess. Genesis 6, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. Two characteristics of the society of Noah. Number one, violence. Number two, immorality. We are in the midst of a society that's turned its back upon God and is caught up in a whirlpool of horror in which we are just going down and down and down as this nation continues to be more immoral and violent in nature. We live in a country that's changed drastically, drastically. The people pulling the strings in this country, they want to destroy the very foundation and base of America so they can remake it. This is not something that's going to come down the road, folks. This is where you're living right now. A new world order. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future for all mankind. All this is being orchestrated. There is a Luciferian hierarchy. We, we all know that. It's in your case. That's who they worship, the God of this world. The closer we get to his return, the signs will increase in two ways. They will become more frequent and more intense, like birth pains. More frequent, more intense. More frequent earthquakes, more intense. More tornadoes, more intense. Scientists are growing increasingly concerned. We have seen changes in extremes of weather. The current changes are very unusual and cannot be explained simply as part of any natural cycle. In the last century, our climate has started to change rapidly. This isn't thought to be just a temporary blip in the system. The evidence points to a long-term change in our climate, which is happening at an unusual rate. Now turning to Pakistan, where at least 121 people... 
people have been killed in the northwestern part of the country following days of heavy rain and landslides. An emergency operation has been launched to reach thousands of people stranded by floods and landslides. Guangxi, China experienced freaky abnormally large hail, but the hail falling from the sky was the size of chicken eggs. The storm apparently came out of nowhere on Saturday afternoon temporarily banned the consumption of sardines in the south of the country after millions of dead fish turned up floating along the shores of the Keolo River. Experts are still investigating the cause of death and any possible risk to human health. To northern Texas now, where they've been pummeled by massive hailstorm. There is widespread damage across parts of the south. Hail bigger than a fist. Baseball-sized softball. Dying. Hail exploded through the windows. The images we see there look biblical. I told my husband, I said, oh my God, there's no way she could have survived this hail. It was so huge. The back window just completely shattered through. It was the scariest thing I've ever experienced. Almost 150 homes battered by the larger than normal hail. These storms had unusually strong updraft. What was most surprising was just how long the large hail fell, relentlessly pounding their homes and cars. On Monday afternoon, the sinkhole is formed in the middle of a Madeira, California street. The void grew from a relatively small crack to a gaping chasm. Authorities estimate the sinkhole is upwards of 20 feet deep. We're witnessing end-time events. Everything is converging. We're witnessing prophecy as it unfolds, and there's a lot that's taking place. To be here today to witness the fulfillment of the Word of God. Flash floods in Saudi Arabia have taken people by surprise. 18 people have been killed during heavy rains and floods across the country. Unprecedented heavy downpours struck the mostly dry country this week. The floods have washed away cars and blocked roads. 126 cities have been affected by the floods. Nearly 2,100 people have been evacuated. To us, 300 homes are underwater. Environmentalists are calling attention to what's happening in Greenland. Never seen this. Southerly winds have produced record high temperatures at 41 degrees above normal. This is an early season heat wave causing a rapid melting of the ice. How rare is this? This is epic. It's one month before we've ever seen the melt. 12% of the land glaciers are now melting. We're seeing the weather patterns very severe in some strange parts of the country. Pretty abnormal weather going on. This is obviously happening globally. The Arctic's never seen these temperatures in modern times. And, and you're saying that we just haven't seen this in our lifetime. This is really abnormal stuff. We've not seen this kind of heat, and we've never seen this kind of heat this early. It's one month in advance of any of the former ice melts. This is epic because also it has the strong probability of disrupting the North Atlantic jet stream, which carries the heat from the equator up into Europe. Scientists say melting ice sheets, especially in Greenland, are changing the distribution of weight on Earth. And because of this, the wobble, which is called polar motion, has changed course. Jesus said, and there will be great earthquakes and in various places. The closer we get to his return, they will become more frequent and more intense, like birth pains. More frequent, more intense. More frequent earthquakes, more intense. Three major earthquakes have rattled the Pacific region in four days. Now scientists say they are worried that the unusual pattern could mean another big one is in our future breaking news. A nation in crisis. Southwestern Japan has been hit by two major earthquakes. Twin earthquakes hitting less than 28 hours apart, rattling homes and knocking down buildings. Entire hillsides were torn apart. Japanese emergency officials say multiple people were killed, many hundreds wounded. The death toll expected to rise. And another ominous sign tonight, one of Japan's most active volcanoes erupting. Breaking news, another large and deadly earthquake. A 7.8 magnitude earthquake struck the central coast of the Ecuador Saturday. The earthquake to hit Ecuador in a century. At least 587 people were killed. More than 8,000 were injured and close to 2,000 buildings were damaged. One town almost completely wiped out. Hundreds more are buried under buildings. The quake follows a series of others in the Pacific and continues to shake the ground with more than 230 aftershocks. These recent seismic events have scientists wondering whether such an unusual pattern means another big one is imminent.
An unprecedented season without rains has left huge swatches of land in eastern Ethiopia bone dry and millions of people starving. Much of their livestock, which they depend on, has been wiped out. In some areas, people have lost up to 90% of their animals. Forced the city to essentially shut down. Record-breaking rainfall in the region has killed five people, displaced thousands, and left nine counties under a state of emergency, making it one of the rainiest single days in history. And in some areas, the water still rises. Tonight, the nation's fourth largest city still swamped by what scientists are calling a one in 500 year flood. 240 billion gallons of water falling in 24 hours as even animals struggling to survive. Hundreds of strong aftershocks have occurred in southern Japan since last Thursday's large earthquake. Dust have registered at least four on Japan's intensity scale, enough to cause buildings to shake. More than 160 people have died after weeks of oppressive heat in southern and eastern India. Much of India is now grappling with an intense heat wave. Temperatures have hit as high as 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Drought conditions in India are currently affecting more than 300 million people in the country, killing thousands of farm animals and damaging crops. Australia's Great Barrier Reef has the most severe bleaching in its history. 95% is white and yellow. Scientists say unless the World Heritage Site gets a break in the weather conditions within weeks, coral areas are unlikely to survive. It's 622 miles. 520 reefs have been examined. Only four are unaffected. This, it's, it's stunning. Local media has reported a school in northern Malaysia has been evacuated due to an outbreak of mass hysteria. The building was shut after students and teachers claimed they saw ghosts walking the halls. School authorities alerted Islamic traditional experts, scholars and even witch doctors to perform prayer sessions and exorcisms. The hysteria began last week after a number of people claimed they had suffered supernatural experience. A group of pupils said they had seen a black figure walking around. One teacher felt a heavy presence was hanging onto her. Another said that a black figure was trying to enter her body. A senior school staff member told the BBC, Our students were possessed and disturbed by these spirits. We are not sure why it happened. We don't know what it is that affected us. Officials are still trying to figure out what happened. Fireball that lit up the skies over southern Britain. This passed over the Hampshire area, witnessed by many people. A second earthquake has struck Ecuador in less than a week. The epicenter of Thursday's magnitude 6 tremor was 100 kilometers. And that kilometers. is some incredible video. The rare dust devil slamming into an elementary school and tossing a student high into the air. The mini twister touching down in the middle of a crowded schoolyard in China, tearing through students and throwing debris in all directions, lifting one student high into the air. That student, so lucky to survive. Across the border in Canada, strong winds and dry weather have turned a stray campfire into a fire tornado, a whirling column of flames and smoke. A firefighter can be seen running away from the blaze and jumping into the river to escape. We have residents in El Salvador scratching their heads, still wondering what exactly lit up the skies blood red earlier this week. Witnesses across hundreds of miles reported seeing a green fireball over Southern California skies Tuesday night. Some 60 million people across the country are in the path of violent storms today. Tornadoes, flash floods, to and giant strong winds. At least 17 tornadoes reported. The storms are unleashing twisters, in some cases, even two at a time. Today, for the first time ever in history, we have a full complement of signs surrounding us, and they are literally shouting that Jesus is coming soon. One sign, one particular sign, and that sign could be summed up in this word, convergence. For the first time ever in history, all of the signs are coming together. All of them are converging. Yes, we are living in the season of the Lord's return. Well, that was a little clip. Well, that was a few years old, that one. But it just showed even back then how things are just happening all around the world. We can live in sort of, should we say, peace in New Zealand. But, you know, things are happening around the world all the time. And they seem to be getting more and more intense and more frequent. What does that mean? 
Well, let's go through where this prophecy came from and unpack it this evening. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus' prediction of the end of the world. If we go back to chapter 21 to get the context, here's where Jesus went into the temple of God and he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house should be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Remember that? He cleared the temple out. And what did he say? He called it my house. Now when you come down to chapter 23, two chapters later, you might recall seven times in that chapter he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Seven times he repeats that. Gives the woes on the Pharisees. And then right at the end of that chapter... He says, behold, what does he say? Your house, exactly, is left unto you desolate. Chapter 21, he said, my house. Now what's he saying? He's saying, your house. He's basically saying, you can have the building. God is not there anymore. And it says, Jesus, this is the beginning of the next chapter now, chapter 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. In fact, that was the last time he'd ever been there. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So they would have heard him say, your house is left unto you desolate. And so they come to him and say, but Lord, look at these magnificent buildings. Now history tells us that the building would have been absolutely wonderful. It talks about some of the stones were 20 metres long. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem, you can do a tour along the western wall underground. And you can see some of these stones, they're the size of a bus. They're huge, massive blocks of marble. How they move them, people don't know today. And so the temple buildings had massive stones in them as well. When Jesus began his ministry, already 46 years they'd been working on this. And they kept working on it right up until only seven years before its destruction in AD 70. So it was a huge project. It must have looked absolutely magnificent. And so here the disciples come and they say, Lord, look at all these wonderful buildings. How can it be desolate? Because in their mind, if this place became desolate, that would be the end of the world. And this is what Jesus said to them. He said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Wow. So for the disciples, they're thinking, what? You mean the temple, the symbol that God is with us, is going to be destroyed? That was pretty shocking to them. And so later they came to him when they sat on the Mount of Olives. And it says, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. They didn't want to draw attention to this, so they came privately and said, tell us, when's this going to happen? Saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So do you notice what they're doing here? Here's a little breakdown of this. Tell us, when shall these things be? In other words, all the temple buildings thrown down, not one stone on another. And what shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? As far as I were concerned, if the temple was destroyed, that would be the end of the world. So they asked, effectively, actually two questions. And it's interesting, Jesus gave one answer, chapter 24 of Matthew, to two questions. It's an amazing prophecy, this one. So one of the fulfillments relates to the destruction of the temple. And the whole chapter we can look at again as signs of Jesus coming. It's an amazing prophecy, and we're going to go through it now. Now, if you look in Mark chapter 13, Luke 21, you'll find the same prophecies repeated. And by comparing them, we can actually glean some more clues. One chapter helps explain the other. And we can get the sequence. In fact, you'll see this here. Matthew 24, Jesus went out from the temple. They came to show in the buildings of the temple. And he says, not one stone will be left here. And you can see the same pattern. Mark 13 talks about all the temple stones being thrown down. And Luke 21, exactly the same. So by comparing these chapters, we can get some very good insights. Now, this is the section for Matthew 24 that we're dealing with. All the prophetic chapters leading right up to the to Jesus coming, and if you look through that, there's ten key steps along the way, which we're going to examine. So the first one is wars and disasters. 
pestilences, earthquakes, famines, nation against nation. These are sort of like six o'clock headline news type stuff. Now the next step, number two, it changes. Now it says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for name, my name's sake. Now it's getting close to home. Do you see that? The first lot is what's happening in the world. Now it gets very personal. After that it says, false prophets shall rise and iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. So conditions are getting very bad. Lots of deceivers coming. And then it says, he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for witness unto all all nations so the gospel is going to go global the truth the message of God is going to go everywhere and then it says then shall the end come then after that comes this when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place the bottom line is flee to the mountains don't go back to get your clothes woe unto them with a child essentially Go. When you see this, whatever it is, and we'll look at that tonight, flee to the mountains. And then it says, then will be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. And except those days be shortened, no flesh will be saved. Then it says, if anyone says to you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. So there's going to be false appearings. People turning up, or something turning up, people think, this is Jesus. And Jesus says, don't believe it because, he says, he gives the reason in verse 27. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, if someone says to you, look, Jesus is here, he's over there, he's in the desert or he's in the secret chambers, don't believe it because when I come back, it's going to be like lightning across the sky. Nobody will miss it. Nobody will have to say to you, Jesus came back and you missed it, but if you go over there you can see him. Everyone will see him when he comes back. Then there's going to be tokens in the heavens. The sun will be darkened, the moon won't give you light, the stars will fall from heaven, and then Jesus comes. So that's the sequence, if you like, 10 steps through Matthew 24, which we could put up like signposts. Imagine you're driving down like State Highway 1, and you're passing these signposts as you go along progressively. So wars and disasters, 6 o'clock news headline stuff, then persecution. And that signals iniquity is going to abound globally, but God is going to have the gospel go to the whole world at the worst time of earth's history. Then the end will come. And what is that? We'll look at that. Then there'll be a sign to flee to the mountains. There'll be great trouble. There'll be false appearings. Then there'll be something in the heavens indicating Jesus is about to come. And then he turns up. The real, the real second coming. So that's the basic sequence through Matthew 24. Now, Jesus says, this was, this is in fulfillment to what they asked. When shall these things be? In other words, the destruction of the temple. And what we'll do now is we'll go through the perspective from the disciples' day and look at the whole sweep of history. And then we'll look at the end, and you can see all these things are going to happen in rapid succession in our day again. So Jesus, the first thing he said, notice this, the very first thing he said was, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am a Christ, and shall deceive many. Deception, obviously, was going to be a big, big factor. Do you see that? First thing he said, don't let anyone deceive you. Did that happen? Absolutely. Look in the history of the early church. Here's what it says in the book of Acts. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That happened in the early church. Deceivers came. And in Peter, he wrote this in his second epistle, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there are false teachers among you who shall bring in damnable heresies. It was a problem in the early church, and it's a huge problem today, isn't it? There's so much out there, misinformation, false information, 
fake news, so to speak, you know, we have to use the Bible to discern what is true. Now, all these were the beginning of sorrows, wars, rumours of wars, nation against nation, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. This is just the start, Jesus says. Were there wars in Jesus' day? Absolutely. The Romans were occupying Israel. The Jews rose up and fought against them in AD 66. Terrible things. What about earthquakes? Yes. History records some massive earthquakes in Crete about that time, Rome in 51 AD, Phrygia 60, Campania 63. There were four famines. In fact, some of these famines are mentioned in the Bible too. So this was a big sign back in the disciples' day. Then it says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. Now it's getting personal. Did that happen to the early Christian church? Absolutely. Horrific persecution. For example, Stephen was stoned to death in AD 64. You read about that in Acts chapter 7. Christians were delivered up to councils. Jesus predicted this. In Acts 28, when they were talking about uh, Paul, they said, as concerning the sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So yes, persecution Oppression in the first centuries on the Christian believers, very prevalent. Deceivers arose, false prophets, iniquity abounded, but he that endure unto the end, the same will be saved. Were there false prophets and deceivers? Yes. Paul wrote, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and the false teachers that Peter spoke about. And John said, even now there are many antichrists, even in their day. This work was beginning already. Now the gospel is going to go to the whole world. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Did that happen? Now some say, well, okay, maybe the then known world. Starting in Jerusalem, the gospel spread all around the world. But if you take these verses literally, the gospel went much further than what we perhaps even imagine. In Romans, he says, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. In Romans 10, he wrote, their sound, speaking about those who preached the gospel, went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. And in Colossians, it says this, the gospel which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now, if you take that literally, it means under the power of Pentecost, the gospel was spread all around the world. Now, we probably have lost a lot of the history of this. But you know, it's well documented. In India, there's the St. Thomas Christians. Have you heard of those? It appears that Thomas, you know, Doubting Thomas, went all the way to India. And there's records he went even as far as China and Japan. All through Africa, there's records of the, me the message getting through there, right up into the far extremes of Scotland and Ireland. Early Christians went and spread the gospel. There's probably a lot of history that we've lost of how that gospel spread around the world in amazing ways. Then there was a sign to flee. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then, let, then which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Wow, so what was this talking about? Now to understand what that abomination of desolation is in Matthew 24, if we compare it with the same outline in Luke 21, it helps unpack. And this is how you use the Bible to understand the Bible. The best explanation for a Bible passage is to look for parallel passages elsewhere and it helps explain what those passages mean. Let the Bible interpret itself. Does that make sense? And here's a classic example of that. Matthew 24 says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. That's the sign that those that are in Judea to flee into the mountains. Now Luke 21 says this, When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And that's the sign to flee to the mountains. So using the Bible to explain itself, the abomination of desolation is the armies that were surrounding Jerusalem. Do you see that? 
And when the Ark of the Abomination of Desolation was standing in the holy place, that is the area around Jerusalem. And you can see this when you compare Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. That's what the Christians were to look for. Matthew and Mark call it the abomination of desolation. Luke 21 calls it armies. What it would be doing, it would be standing in or standing or compassing. And it says the holy place or where it ought not or Jerusalem. So that's what it was all about. And Jesus had predicted this in Luke 19. He says, the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. Jesus had predicted this. The day was coming when the enemies, the Roman army in other words, would come and surround the city, Jerusalem, and it says this, keep thee in on every side. Keep that in mind. Keep thee in on every side. They're going to be trapped in the city. Now, where do we find this in Daniel? Jesus says, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And this is found in Daniel 9. Actually, it's in two places. I'll tell you what's interesting. Two places because Matthew 24 has two applications. The first application for the disciples, the parallel is in Daniel chapter 9. There's another one in chapter 11, which is applicable for our day. But that's for another evening. But the first one is Daniel 9. You can see that Jesus was talking about the temple when he said not one stone will be left on another that won't be thrown down. And he said to watch for this abomination of desolation. In chapter 9 it talks about the people of the prince that shall come. In other words the Roman army shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So there it is. Jesus talked about the temple, all the stones being thrown down. Daniel hundreds of years before, had said, the, the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And it talked about the desolations unto the end of the war. There's the abomination of desolation that Jesus was referring to. So that's the parallel passage. And that was a sign to flee to the mountains. Now that's a little puzzle because Jesus had said, the enemies will come, cast a trench about thee, compass thee round, in other words, totally surround you, and keep you in on every side. And yet he said, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then you're to flee to the mountains. Now do you see a little problem there, a little puzzle? If you're in Jerusalem city, and Jesus says, okay, when the city gets totally surrounded and you're kept in on every side, that's the time to get out of the city and flee. Can you see a little problem there? <laughs> that's literally what it's saying. How could you flee from Jerusalem if the sign to flee is when you're totally surrounded and trapped in the city? <laughs> Do you see a problem? And if you're listening to Jesus, you would say, well, that doesn't make sense. But, you know, history tells us the wisdom of what Jesus says. Josephus explains this, and you can find this in the Wars of the Jews. In AD 66, the Roman army came and surrounded Jerusalem, AD 66. And Josephus recalls what happened. It then happened that Cestius recalled his soldiers from the place, and without having received any disgrace, he retired from the city without any reason in the world. So for some unknown reason, Cestius withdrew, called all the soldiers back, and began leaving. And history tells us that a lot of the Jews got together, rallied, and chased after them, and assaulted the back of that army, and actually killed many of them. And they thought they got a great victory. They chased them away. And as far as they were concerned, yay, we've got rid of the Romans. But that was the sign. That was the sign. So Jesus said, flee to the mountains. So the Romans withdrew. The Romans had cleared the land of anyone that might have hindered the Christians leaving and many of the Jews chased after the Romans and so the Christians had free exit out of the city and history tells us from Eusebius's church history that they went to a place called Perea many of them and a place in Perea called Pella which on the map is up here there it is there here's Jerusalem so a lot of them left across the river Jordan and went to Pella and there's the ruins of an ancient church there by the way interestingly now the Jews thought, yay, we've got rid of the Romans. And if you ever get to Masada in Israel, 
and stay at the youth hostel there, you'll find this on the wall there. This is a display of coins that they found on Masada. Do you know what Masada is? Anyone know? It's like a hilltop fortress. Herod built this palace near the Dead Sea. Beautiful views. And in the uprising against the Romans, many of the rebels, if you want to call them that, or, or freedom fighters, occupied those palaces and made them like a fortress. It's a very easy to defend hilltop. And they had these coins. And when the archaeologists examined this place, because you know what happened, the Romans came and besieged that and they attacked it. And all the people up top, about a thousand of them, all committed suicide rather than be taken captive by the Romans. And when the archaeologists came, they found these coins. And it's interesting, the writing on this, it says year two of free Jerusalem. These coins date to AD 67. So in AD 66, Cestius came, surrounded Jerusalem and then backed off. And the Jews chased after them and killed many of them. And they thought, finally, we're free. Jerusalem is free. And the following year, in AD 67, they minted these coins saying, year two of free Jerusalem. They thought, we're done. We're free again. We've got rid of the Romans. But you know what happened? You don't mess with Imperial Rome. <laughs> in AD 70, Titus came with a Roman army and surrounded Jerusalem and that was it. And everything Jesus said happened. This is from Encyclopedia Britannica. The rebellion against Rome that began in AD 66 soon focused on the temple and effectively ended with the temple's destruction on the 9th or 10th of Aviv, AD 70. So four years later, the temple got destroyed as predicted by Jesus. All that remained of the first temple was the, a portion of the Western Wall, also called the Wailing Wall, which continues to be the focus of Jewish aspirations and pilgrimage. Terrible. The article goes on to say, in his campaign, that's Titus, in which a million Jews were reputed to have died, culminated in the capture and destruction of Jerusalem. The Romans came back besieged it, horrible things took place in that city. Starvation, there's records of people eating their own children, horrible. And the Romans finally broke in and had a massive slaughter. They burnt the place. They, and what happened, the temple had gold on the walls. And when it burnt, it said the gold ran down, melted and in the cracks. And the Romans literally ploughed the temple mount, digging up that gold. And hence, all the stones were thrown down, just as Jesus said. Amazing. Jesus said not, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And Josephus records that Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and temple. So the whole place was destroyed just as Jesus had predicted. Amazing. If you go to Jerusalem today, you'll see these walls, but these walls you see today don't date to Jesus' time. They date to the Ottoman period. They were rebuilt in the Ottoman period, but along the line of where the old walls used to be, in some places like the Damascus Gate, which is just here, you can see the Roman stones way at the bottom now, still, still there. And the Western Wall, you can see, can you see there's a distinct line here below which there are larger stones, and above there's smaller stones. Do you see that? Those larger stones are the stones from the time of Jesus. The stones above, that is the Ottoman period wall, when they built the mosque, or the Dome of the Rock. The mosque's actually off to the, to the right there. Now some say, if you ever hear this, this curly question, they say, well look, the stones are still there. So did Jesus' prediction fail? He said not one stone upon another, but there were still stones upon another. Did his prediction fail? And the answer is no. Don't get ever trapped by that one. Because if you go back to what Jesus was talking about, it says the disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And he says, see you not all these things, the buildings, every stone will be thrown down. And in fact, when he said, see you not all these things, they would have been standing on the Temple Mount up here and you couldn't even see these stones because they're over the edge. This is just a retaining wall. It's not a building if you follow that. So Jesus' prediction was perfectly fulfilled. 
One thing he said was, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Obviously winter would be a horrible time to have to leave your home and flee with what you've got on your back and escape somewhere. And the other thing is, he says, don't pray that you're not fleeing on the Sabbath day. And this is AD 70. Long time after the cross, Jesus is praying, to, saying to his disciples, pray that your flight's not on the Sabbath day. The Christians were still keeping the Sabbath 40 years later. Important point. Then will be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And Jesus passes from that time right down, quickly down to his second coming. And between the destruction of Jerusalem and his second coming, he says there's going to be this great tribulation. What is this? So this tribulation is going to involve the elect or God's people. And it's going to be shortened, cut short for the sake of God's people. What is this great tribulation? And immediately after will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. You'll see that in verse 29. So between Jerusalem being destroyed and between the second coming was this great tribulation. What is this talking about? This is talking about the Dark Ages. For century upon century upon century, God's faithful people, Christians, were persecuted for their faith. Horrific things went on. It records that Possibly 50 million or more perished in this time, just because it went on for so long, the persecution against genuine Christians. Horrible things were done in the name of Jesus. It's interesting that the organization responsible for this have actually apologized and asked for forgiveness for the wrongs that have been committed. Interesting. And here's an interesting quote. For professing faith, contrary to the teaching of the Church of Rome, History records the martyrdom of more than a hundred million people simply because it went on for so long. That's why we call it the Dark Ages. Horrible time in history. A lot we could say about that, but anyway. So for a thousand years, people, God's people sought refuge in the wilderness. But those days would be shortened, it says. For the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And around about 1770 to 1780, the persecutions where people were put to death for teaching contrary to the Church of Rome, that sort of came to an end. But largely through the, inf the influence of the Reformation. People like Martin Luther, John Huss, Philip Melanchthon, William Tyndale, etc., protested the abuses that were going on in the medieval church. And the Reformation sort of put an end to the absolute control that Rome had, and so persecution ceased by the late 1700s. When Martin Luther stood up, he wasn't trying to start a new church. He wanted to reform the only church that he knew about. But as often happens, the establishment often gets stubborn, shall we say, and the reforms that should have taken place never did, and hence you had all these Protestant denominations come up in response. Now in our Matthew 24 sequence, it says, Then, if anyone says to you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, false Christs and false prophets will arise, showing great wonders. Now, there's a theological dictionary that records over 24 false messiahs over 1,300 years. In fact, you can look this up on Wikipedia. Uh, if you look up list of Jewish messiah claimants, all through the different centuries, so many people arose saying, I'm Christ, and lead people off into places like the desert. Another point, too, is that when these false Christs arose, they would show great signs and wonders. If you see a miracle before your eyes, is that proof that it's the power of God? Not necessarily. Be warned on that. Jesus warned that there will be great signs and wonders by false messiahs. So miracles in themselves is not a proof it's the power of God. Always keep that in mind. Satan can do miracles too. 
And he says, if, if they say he's in the desert, go not forth, behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not, for his lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So no one will ever miss Jesus' true coming. So don't be deceived by a false Messiah. Now it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give you light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. Now, if that tribulation ended, roughly about 1770s, 1780s was the last recorded um, inquisition, shall we say. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days, there's going to be signs. So, were there signs straight after the persecutions of the Dark Ages ended? And there was. In May 19, 1780, was a mysterious dark day. The first sign, it says, well, the sun will be darkened. I've got an old history book at home, given to me by a good friend. It's called Our First Century. This is history of the United States for the first 100 years. And it records the events from 1776 to 1876. This book was written in 1876, about the first 100 years of the United States. And there's a, and you can see here, this is the front piece, 100 great and memorable events of perpetual interest in the history of our country. And there's a whole section called the Wonderful Dark Day of 1780. And it records how, it says, almost, if not altogether alone, as, as the most mysterious and as yet unexplained phenomenon of its kind in nature's diversified range of events during the last century stands the Dark Day of May 19, 1780. A most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens and atmosphere in New England. Whole area just went dark. Amazing. It talks about here, this darkness was not caused by an eclipse because the positions of the planetary bodies at the time, the moon was 150 degrees out. In other words, it wasn't the moon coming between the sun because they weren't in alignment like that at the time. Quite bizarre. Here's some newspaper reports. The true cause of this remarkable phenomenon is not known. The cocks crew as at daybreak. Everything bore the appearance of the gloom of night. Really bizarre. Candles were lighted in many houses. The birds were silent and disappeared. The fowls retired to roost. It was a general opinion that the day of judgment was at hand. Amazing. So what explained it? Who knows? Then, it, notice it said, the moon shall not give her light. That's what Jesus said. And history records this. The disk of the moon on those dates was of a reddish copper color. A strange, eerie red looking moon came up. Now the next sign was, the stars shall fall from heaven. Did that happen? Yes, on November 13, 1833, amazing event happened. Here's a record of those events. The most magnificent meteor shower on record. For nearly four hours the sky was literally ablaze. More than a billion shooting stars appeared over the United States and Canada alone. Amazing. The morning of November 13, 1833 was rendered memorable by an exhibition of the phenomenon called shooting stars, which is probably more extensive and magnificent than any similar one hitherto recorded. They seem to shower down in groups, calling to mind the fig tree casting untimely figs. Amazing. And that old history book I've got at home records exactly the same thing. Here's chapter 36. It says, sublime meteoric shower all over the United States. And there were recordings of this in Europe as well. This was viewed in Europe. It happened there also. And it says, uh, the, for hours in fiery commotion, the whole firmament over the United States, the whole sky was lit up with these shooting stars. Absolutely amazing. There's a quote here that says, Arago computes that no less than 240,000 meteors were at the same time visible above the horizon of Boston. Can you picture that? Nearly a quarter of a million shooting stars simultaneously. Have you ever seen a shooting star? You're out at night and you see this little white streak. <laughs> 
Imagine 240,000 of them all going at once. It'd be amazing. So that's what happened. The shooting stars, 1833. Lots of quotes we could look at. Ages may roll away before the world will again be surprised and delighted with the display of celestial fireworks equal to that of the morning of November 13, 1833. Amazing. Anyway, so where do we live? We live at this point because the next thing to happen will be then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels to gather his elect. So according to that outline of Matthew 24, starting with the days of the disciples, and looking at the destruction of the temple, and looking how it's fulfilled through history, this is the next major event to happen. Jesus coming back. Now, that prophecy is amazing because when Jesus gave this prophecy and gave these signposts, he was answering two questions. What was the sign of these things, the temple being destroyed, and what's the sign of your coming and the end of the world? So we can look at that prophecy again, all, everything we've just looked at, and guess where we are on the timeline today? Can you picture where we are today? What was that? Well, yes, from the historical perspective, from the days of the disciples, we're basically waiting in here. But this whole chapter applies to the days in which we're living, and we're running through the timeline again. And we're basically about number one again, if you know what I mean. And we're going to see persecution again. Again, the gospel is going to go to the whole world. Again, there's going to be some sort of end. There's going to be great tribulation again. And there's going to be tokens in the heavens and then Jesus will come. Those two timelines converge on number 10, Jesus coming back. Are we seeing wars and disasters and pestilence and famines today? Yes, absolutely. We are living in point number one again. And it's going to move towards number two. In fact, even today around the world, there are Christians suffering persecution today. One day it's going to be a global phenomenon. It's going to be universal. We can see famines now. We can see pestilences, bird flu, as Asia hatching the next pandemic. And this is from some years ago. What have we seen lately come out of Asia? Exactly, coronavirus. Had a huge impact on the world. These signs are going to start going global, not just localised, but global. And we've seen this already going global. Earthquakes in diverse places. Wars and rumours of wars. Do we see a lot of wars today? Many. Something interesting, that verse that says, if you look at it, here it is using the Greek uh, uh, interlinear thing. Matthew 24, 7, for nation shall rise against nation. Now that word nation there, both times, for nation, can you see the Greek number there? Greek number 1484. This is the word here, and it's literally ethnos, the Greek word ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnicity from. It's translated, well, it means a race or a tribe. Do you get that? So when it says nation against nation, it actually literally means an one ethnic group against another ethnic group. Do you follow that? Are we seeing that today? Absolutely. We're seeing racial tension ratcheting up. Have you seen that in the news, racial tension ratcheting up? Absolutely. And we see a lot of this. You know, Martin Luther King said a riot is the language of the unheard. And what do we see happening right now in the States? This sort of thing, by any means necessary. People campaigning Black Lives Matter. Have you heard of Black Lives Matter by any chance in the news? Absolutely. Just racial tension, anything to ratchet up racial tension, isn't it? That's exactly what Jesus predicted. 
nation against nation, it says in English, but literally ethnic group against ethnic group. And we're seeing that. Big riots. Terrible. And the reaction of the police, things being burnt. This is all stuff you could see every night on the news, you know, things that are happening over there. Police cars being burnt. Hatred between police and the population. What about this part here? This is Luke. This is the parallel passage in Luke. It says, the sea and the waves roaring. What's that all about? What have we seen a lot in the last decade? Tsunamis, yes. Exactly. 2004, huge tsunami. And we don't have to go into all the details. Horrible things. Then, a few years later, in Samoa, there's a big earthquake there in Samoa. Boom. Whole town wiped out. This is some pictures from the Samoan tsunami. Not many people remember this. Town is wiped out. This is inside a church. All the water came through the windows and that's what it looked like after that. Cars and vehicles wrecked, boats on land. Terrible things. Then in 2011, what happened in Japan? Massive, massive earthquake. The barriers they had up to stop tsunamis were inadequate. It was so huge. Water rushing over whole town swamp, there's a train swept off the tracks, amazing, airport got destroyed, boats swept up onto land, amazing, there's a boat in the middle of a whole lot of buildings, here's an interesting one, look at that, <laughs> how do you think that got up there, <laughs> shows how high the water was, there's a truck parked, lifted up on top of a building, amazing, there's a car dropped on top of a building, that's how high the water got. Here's a container terminal just swept away. Towns flattened, you know. These are the sort of things that happened during that. All of these are signs, so we're in that step one again, going through that timeline once again, and we're seeing global big events happening. Here's an interesting shot. Someone saw a building, a house floating out in the middle of the sea, swept away. When I saw that, I thought, that's just like this picture here, Noah's Ark. The Ark of Salvation swept away. Jesus says, as it was, at the end of that chapter, Matthew 24, as it, the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What's the parallel here? Noah had been given a, giving the people a warning, hadn't he? There's a flood coming. Get on the ark. And people ignored it. They carried on with life as normal. They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage as if no problem at all. And what happened? The flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. God is going to have warnings in our day. Wake up calls, shall we say. And sadly, most people... The vast majority are going to carry on life as normal and try to ignore the warnings. What do you think we should do as, as believers in God? Should we listen to his warnings, take heed? Absolutely. So like Noah, we'll be ready for when the disasters come. And likewise, as we saw the other day with Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. And then destruction came, and the people hadn't listened to the warnings, hadn't heeded the message that God had. There's going to be great tribulation again. It's coming again. The Bible says in Daniel 12, there will be a time of trouble such as never was. This is coming. But the good news is, there is an ark of safety in our day. Not a literal wooden boat that Noah's going to build, it says, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. God, nothing takes God by surprise. He knows exactly what's coming. And if we listen to his voice and follow his counsel, we can be safe from what's coming. Very important.